Okay, so now I'll introduce uh, Dr. Ferrando. Dr. Francesca Ferrando teaches philosophy at New York University. They hold a PhD in philosophy at the University of Roma 3 in Italy and a master's degree in gender studies uh, at the Utrecht University Holland. They were the recipient of the Philosophical Prize Premio Sainati with the uh, acknowledgement of the President of the Italian Republic, Dr. Fernando is the author of several publications, including Philosophical First Humanism, this is it, and their last uh, latest book is The Art of Being Posthuman, which has just been released by Ponty Press, and here it is. Their work has been translated into a dozen languages, including Arabic, Chinese, Mandarin, uh, German, Hungarian, Korean, Polish, Portuguese, Romanian, Russian, Turkish, Spanish, and Urdu. Dr. Ferrand is the founder of the Global Posthuman Network, a local network with more than uh, 1,500 uh, uh, international members. In the history of the TED Talks, uh, they were the first speakers to give a talk on the subject of the posthuman. And as a public intellectual, they were named one of the uh, 100 top creatives making change in the world by Origin magazine. Dr. Ferrando has been active in the posthuman field for more than a decade. They are a leading voice uh, in the field of posthuman studies. So, welcome. the key keynote with a question because uh, um, as you know Dr. Ferrando is a posthumanist post scholar but terms like posthumanism, transhumanism or anti-humanism are often mentioned both in the public and in the academic debate uh, from a rigorous theoretical perspective. What is the meaning of each of these categories and what are the differences and connections between them? But first of all, I would like to thank so much everyone for organizing this incredible event. I'm having a blast. I arrived here uh, Thursday night and it's been a non-stop joy, fantastic conversation, incredible meetings. And so it's been really a more than a joy to be here. So thank you so much, Daniele, Valentina, Megan, Serenella, all the people, all the participants, and all the amazing talks uh, and all your work. It is really nourishing not only academia, but humanity as a species. So I am more than honored to be here. And I also would like to say that uh, what we are doing is something very unique. Because we are not just uh, studying something that happened. We are in the midst of a way of re-understanding who we are, not just as individuals, but as a society. And I'm going to add a layer here, as a species. So this is why I think that posthumanism is a very, very exciting field to be in. Because it's not something that is already being written. It's not just you studying the archives of some people who died or some people who maybe are still alive. But we need everyone's voice because this is a plurilogue, this is a multilogue, this is a dialogue, this is a, an expansive uh, collective vision as a species. And so I um, used to be um, uh, feeling very close by the notion of the species. In this first book, I kind of deconstructed the notion of the species. And I, I saw it as a, as a notion that it was, you know, really used to, 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 to bring the human, to give the human some type of supremacy, which can be called anthropocentrism. But then with my second book, after the pandemic, so this book is, uh, they just came out with Quality Press, and uh, actually it's been uh, quality presented into Arabic. And with this book, uh, something changed. And I actually was in North Carolina when I realized that I really wanted to write this book. It was during the pandemic. It was a very intense time, I think, of everyone life. It was 2019. And I was first based in New York City. And I had, uh, I teach at NYU, I had students from China, and I had a family in Italy. Those were the first two nations that were really touched by the pandemic. And so I knew how serious it was going to be. And at first there was some denialism in, in New York City, so they was like, oh, don't worry, just keep doing what you're doing, everything is going to be fine. And I knew that it was not going to be like that, because I guess, people coming from China and Italy tell me it's not going to be easy. And uh, eventually it became really intense in New York City. We had the luck of a family here that are actually, they are here today. They're also part of the book. Uh, there is Sophia, my daughter, and, and Eleanor, and all the mom and papa and everyone. Anyway, we got lucky enough to come to North Carolina, and all of a sudden everything changed. We were in, the, in, a, in a beautiful area, 
uh, not many humans, and I all of a sudden I felt at peace with myself. So first of all, I wanted to thank the land to give me serenity in a moment in which I was, I was deeply distressed. And my second mother just got COVID at the time. At the time, it looked like if you got COVID, you were going to die. It was like, wow. And I came here, and all of a sudden, everything was different. I felt good. And I realized that I had to, be, I had to write this book. And uh, you know, like, I, I don't know how long we are going to be on this earth. I don't know how, how long we're going to be. But during the pandemic, death became very real. I remember you know, watching all these videos and, and images of, of a lot of bodies. And I, I remember thinking very clearly about the possibility of, of dying. And I realized that uh, if my life was going to end, I had to write this book. It was that important to me. It was uh, so important to me that I spent the next five years writing it. And something changed here. So you're going to see a difference between the notion of the human here in this book, which was more for the academic community, and this book, which is go well beyond the academic community. And here the species become a place to encounter each other. Because we all come from different nations, different genders, different religions, different ethnicities. But we're all part of one species, if you want to call it the human. And this species is not, of course, close. But this species is, uh, you know, a, a, is an evolving uh, wave and, and, and river in which we hold all the DNA of all the other species that got extinct. They are not extinct, they're part of us. Neanderthals, Elisovans, uh, Homo erectus, etc., etc. So um, going you know, the, to the question of, uh, that Daniela was asking, why so important to be in this field? Because uh, we are uh, going to the roots of philosophy. And the roots of philosophy, if you think about the term itself, come from two ancient Greek notions, which is philos and sophia. And philos means love, and sophia means wisdom. And so you can either translate it as the wisdom of love, or the love for wisdom. Usually the second translation is more used. And so if we go into the tradition, we are doing philosophy or, or academia or literature, whatever you're doing, because you, know, you want to know who you are. Because if you forget about that, then it doesn't matter what you're studying. You are, not, you are not contributing to your own existential growth. You might know everything about the stars, but if you don't know who you are, does that really matter in your life? And so when we're talking about uh, the posthuman way, which is not one, there is posthumanism, there is transhumanism, there is anti-humanism, there is meta-humanism, there is new materialism, there is object ontology, you name it. Uh, you, should not get, you should not get scared when I bring all these notions. You should get excited. Because it means that you're a pluridog with not one vision only. There is not one vision here. There are multiple visions. And so the question is, who are we as humans? Uh, obviously, the answer is going to be different. So according to posthumanism, which is uh, the philosophy that I connect uh, deeply with, the idea of the human is an idea that you cannot disconnect from other foundational notions and entities and realities, such as, for instance, among many others, ecology and technology. And you could name many more. But I'm going to mention these two for a specific reason. First of all, because in the last 200 years, especially after the Industrial Revolution, we started to disconnect the human from the oikos. In fact, ecology, ecology, like economy, economy, come from, again, ancient Greek, oikos which means the home. And of course the question is, uh, is the planet a home or is who we are? Think of yourself right now. Think of your bodies. Think of the biota in your guts. So for this bacteria that allow you to be here, that allow you to be healthy, you are the universe. I don't know if the bacteria has any consciousness that maybe there is something beyond a specific organ or a specific body. By the way, we are made of bacteria. We have millions of them, not only in the guts, in the brain, everywhere. To the point that uh, right now, scientifically speaking, some people are saying we are conscious because of the interaction of all these bacteria within us. So right now, you are a multiverse right now, yourself. Your body is a multiverse right now. Now, if we keep expanding, I don't know if any of you is uh, familiar with the Russian dolls, the matrioska, and you keep opening. From, from, this, from the very big, you keep opening, you go to the small one. Or from the small one, you keep closing and you get the big one. So if we think of ourselves like that, we are part of, for instance, a bigger body, which is the Earth. Uh, there are many exercises we could do to, to think that way. We can do it later if we want. Uh, and these also connect to 99 of our histories, the species, 
that was during the Paleolithic and the Neolithic time, where the earth was not seen as something that you could own. You could not own the land. And this also goes, of course, very well with native wisdom, native epistemologies. And so the earth is the mother, Pachamama. Mother not in a gender sense, but in a sense of regeneration and creation. So we come from that, we are going to go back to that. And one of the questions is about life and death, and these are kind of new concepts. Because in the cycle of regeneration, there is neither life nor death. But we can go on to this later. So I want to say that uh, the question that is at the core of this movement is, what does it mean to be human? But this is not done, at least from a posthumanist perspective, to give more entitlements to the human. Not so much because this would be uh, anthropocentric, but because it would be an existential obfuscation. It wouldn't allow me to understand who am I, who I am, if I try to understand who I am just to feel superior to others. Forget about other humans, can be other species. So I want to understand who I am as a human to feel superior to non-human species, which has been uh, the trend in the last 200 years. So the, the core understanding here is that there is no me without non-me elements. This also comes from the teaching, for instance, also great Zen master Pinyatan. So there is no me without non-me elements. For instance, right now, if I stop breathing, you're going to get me to the hospital. Because I might pass. I need the air. And these are we're breathing, the same air, but together. That's why we got the pandemic, by the way. And that's why some people are breathing. <laughs> I don't mean the mask. <laughs> I am the social distance now. <laughs> <laughs> or, think of the water. If I stop drinking, I might go, you know, I might be still around for some days. If I'm lucky, some weeks. And if I'm not lucky, I'm going to pass. I need non-me elements. Who am I? What about my DNA? My DNA comes from millions of beings before me. So it is very interesting, I think, as a movement, because it really allows to understand one and many at the same time, which is a notion that having the West is not as easy to conceive, but it's easier coming from other, other traditions. That one and many can be there at the same time. You are one, and you're also many right now. Think of you in this moment. Think of you five years ago, actually. Think about you, yourself, five years ago. Think of the way you looked. What kind of food you liked. Your friends at the time. Where were you living? Take a moment. Five years ago. And then think of yourself ten years ago, if you were already around. Some people here are six years old, so they were not around yet. <laughs> they were everywhere, but not here yet. But uh, let's say, see, yeah, let's say, let's say six years ago then. So everyone was around. And then think of yourself. Ten years from now, can you see yourself? What do you see? And so who are you? So of course you can see a connection between all these, all these needs. But there is also a, di a diversification. So you are one and many at the same time. So in that sense, I want to say that post-human is a way, is a movement where there is a lot going on. I talk a little more about post-humanism, philosophical post-humanism, I have a whole book about this. The other movement that I want to mention, uh, and if there is intense, we can go to Antony or the others, is transhumanism. I am personally not a transhumanist thinker, but I do think that transhumanism is very fascinating. Because transhumanists are excellent, are envisioning possi future possibilities. Of course, they forget that there is a past, you cannot erase, because time is not, is not linear. It's a cycle, if you want, or it's a spiral. So they kind of tend to forget, they think, in, they, they conceive time more as a linear sense. The past is gone, we are right now, and the future is coming. So they're really excited about the future. And they do a great job about envisioning possibility for the human species. Very interesting ones. One is immortality, that they was renamed as radical life extension, because they got a lot of criticism. And if you think about it, one of the first mythologies, not the first one, the first one is something we never studied in Anna, amazing, amazing mythology, I highly recommend everyone to read the scene. This the sense of in Anna, the first trinity, all uh, the female that is not, of course, just gender. But one of the first mythologies is Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh is the hero who wants immortality. Now, this specific uh, uh, mythology comes th it was written thousands of years ago. So I would say that, you know, the transhumanists are not so much out there. There was something that humans have been wanting for a long time. That they were raising the notion of death. And so they are going to science and technology. A lot of transhumanists, at the, especially at the beginning of the movements, were atheists. Now it's different. There is Mormon transhumanism, there is Christian transhumanism, there is Muslim, Muslim 
transhumans, Hindu transhumans. But especially at the beginning, it was very much atheistic. And so once that God is dead, according to Nietzsche, how can you replace that uh, final answer? Now that God is dead, we have, we have Google. Google can save us. Who am I? Google knows. Google, Google will save us. Science and technology will save us. That's, that's transhumanism. And so they have this, uh, you know, I, 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 I know all the philosophers of, the, of this way. They are great people and great friends. Uh, but to me, as a philosopher, let's say that it seems a little reductionist to replace one God with another. Now that God is dead, now we have science and technology. So keep doing what you're doing. We will find technological solutions. That's transhumanism. And posthumanism says, you cannot keep doing what you're doing. Because if you keep doing what you're doing, you're forgetting who you are. If you're destroying the planet, you'll destroy yourself. Because that is your body. This, this is your metal body. And in fact, right now, number one reason for uh, death in the human uh, species is anthropogenic uh, causes. For instance, cancer by living in polluted areas. So there is no way that we can separate and just take as much from the earth and just you know, keep having a healthy human society. That's never going to happen because the earth is who we are. So, you know, transhumanism is very interesting. The main goal of transhumanism, let's see if anyone can answer, please. What is the main goal of transhumanism? It's an easy one. And it's also the symbol of the platform online, which is H+. What does that mean? H+. You know, it's human enhancement. That is, the main goal of transhumanism is enhancing the human. So, of course, some of you can say, well, what about post-anthropocentrism? There is no post-anthropocentrism in transhumanism. In fact, transhumanism has been defined as an ultra-humanism, pushing the human to the next level, living thousands of years. Not, no longer 80, forget about your 80 years. You're not old, you're young. 80 year old, you're a baby. What about living thousands of years? And it is very interesting because uh, I personally nothing against on all, in all in favor of that. I think it's a very interesting topic. But I do, I've been teaching these topics for uh, now 10 years at NYU. And so I asked my students, and then I was very surprised, especially at the beginning. Now I kind of expect the answer. But uh, when I started, I expected that many, most people wanted to live thousands of years, or maybe be immortal. But then when I asked this question to my students, they take it very seriously, they would think about it. And then I would ask, who wants to live forever, or who wants to live for thousands of years? And usually, let's say, out of 25, maybe one or two people wanted that. And I was very surprised at first. And then I would say, well, why, why don't you, not that I necessarily want it, but why don't you want that? And some people would say, you know, I will be bored, or, you know, life is already so competitive, I don't want 1,000 years of competitive <laughs> life. <laughs> yes, I was very surprised. And then we did another exercise. So it assumes one of the things that it wants to be erases pain and suffering, which I would say probably ask you right, right now to you, do you want pain and suffering? Anyone wants pain and suffering? Yeah, so the first answer probably people are okay with it. But then listen to this. I would ask my students, again, we were doing um, human enhancement, and again, I was very surprised at first. I would ask them, take a moment, we do a lot of uh, thought experiments, and think about something that really changed you, that made you grow as a person. So take a moment, actually, why don't you do it right now? Take a moment, one minute, and think of something in your life that really changed you, that really uh, made you grow as a person, that you know, enhanced your uh, existential level, that made you wiser, that made you uh, more compassionate, that, uh, that made you uh, stronger on some level. Take a minute. All right, so we can actually ask around what came out, but I am very surprised, I'm still am very surprised, that when I ask this question and we do this class, uh, uh, except for the experiment, the answer is usually something painful, usually the death of someone in the family, or someone who got really sick, or someone who maybe applied to Chapelier and didn't get, uh, didn't get in, a bad grade. And I was very surprised at first, I would say, and, uh, and usually no one would say something very positive. Maybe one person out of 25 would say, oh, an amazing sunset or anything like that. But usually it was something that you would define as negative. And so I, I would ask, like, why is that? Why would you define this as, as a moment of growth? Because, you know, it came out that pain made this person much stronger, or that made them more compassionate. And now, I don't have any conclusions on this, but I do ask you, if we are trying to erase pain and suffering from the human species, are we losing or are we gaining? 
There is no answer, there is not right or wrong. But I wonder if anyone has something to say on this, and then we go on. But these are the questions, and these are the questions for the human species, because this is happening at the genetic level. This is, we're talking about genetic modifi modification, the first genetic modifi genetically modified human, uh, historically speaking, that was uh, uh, proved and, and uh, propagated it was in 2017. So this is already happening. So how do you feel about uh, enhancing the human so-called or uh, uh, genetically manipulating the human to, for instance, get rid of death or to have a radical life extension or to, to get rid of pain or suffering? How do you feel about that? Because of course it sounds appealing at first, but then when you look into that, do you want to live forever? Do you want to get rid of pain and suffering? Can I ask if uh, anyone wants to share something? Otherwise we can go on. I know that at the end we have some time. Anything that you would like to say? I'm thinking about the concept of living a long life, a thousand years, whatever, may seem appealing, but in this environment, in this country, America, you will probably run out of resources long before that, and then you'll be living a life that you never thought, probably almost feral, and thousands of people, millions of people are going to be that. So Yeah, the transhumanists today will say, well, there is space. Unlimited resources on space, how do you feel about that? That's the answer, that's something, oh, don't, don't, don't worry about the Earth, we're going to Mars in 10 no. years, 5 years, <laughs> 2 years. I think that uh, the race for power of any kind transcends the desire to live. We'll no, we, only, we only unite in times of crisis, and even that is gone now. And we're in a post-irony world where many countries have the power and the wherewithal to obliterate others. And so who's going to get the resources? Who's going to, are we all going to unite and do it? I don't, I don't see that happening. Beautiful. And it's actually connected to one of the questions of the time of crisis. Thank you so much. Is anyone else want to share before we go to the next uh, questions and uh, part of the presentation? All right, so let's go on, and of course we're going to end a full uh, you know, time for a presentation and questions. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about your last book. You uh, undertake the posthuman question in your last book uh, in a new way, um, so to speak, from theory to practice. But what it means, a posthuman practice, in your opinion, particularly in relation to the non-human? Like a question. Yeah, so Daniel, should we present the, the book to answer this question, or maybe oh, answer the question and then... As you prefer. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we do the presentation and yes. the... If you click this, go. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have a very short presentation, because I really wanted to keep like the discussion going on, so I'm going to be super brief. Uh, my name is Francesca Ferrando. Uh, this is my website, if you want to you know, get more resources, uh, art, free articles, videos, and all of that. All right, so um, this was my previous book, The Philosophical Posthumanism, and this was uh, for academia. At the time, this was published in 2019, there was a lot of confusion of people who wanted to talk about the human species, but they didn't have the same language. So people would accuse, for instance, the posthumanists to be uh, ultra anthropocentric, without understanding that posthumanism is not transhumanism. And some of the people would, uh, you know, accuse transhumanism or something that, you know, maybe it's more related to posthumanism. So there was a lot of confusion. So to me, if we are going to have a dialogue, we need to understand each other. And so that book was to bring a lot of clarification within the community. Uh, the second book that I'm going to talk about right now, the art of being posthuman, is a gift uh, to me of the pandemic. Uh, uh, it was uh, I realized that. Uh, I have to get out of the Agony Tower. I love academia, that's why I'm here. I love the community that I met in academia. All of you are incredible. Uh, I also realized that uh, outside of academia, people are ready to hear uh, uh, and to be part of the discussion. It was happening. And so the art of imposthuman became to me an existential quest. So if during the pandemic, posthumanists did not help me, why would I be even working on that? I didn't care anymore. I had to make sure that posthumanists had get my life, life meaning. And I was very honest, because I didn't, there was no uh, degree, there was no honors, there was no um, price, there was no salary. It was us in our life. And so if you knew that uh, you didn't have unlimited time on, on your, on your, on your, in your life, what are you going to do with this time? 
And so I asked myself, uh, because I was already very much part of the posthuman community, is this posthumanism helping me in this moment of crisis? And I was very honest. And so I looked into that, and it did help me a lot. It did help me to realize that pandemic was not just coming out of nowhere. It was a, a, a result of humans not respecting non-human boundaries. And uh, it gave me a lot of peace of mind. And also realized that viruses are not just bad. Uh, and there is a whole section about vir slash us. Vir us, vir us. Because we, for instance, the placenta, when we're in the, in the belly of our mother, the placenta is a result of a retrovirus infection. Um, and so we are the result of this uh, uh, trillions of uh, uh, unlimited interaction of bacteria and viruses and all these non-human elements between the commas, the whole genome. Um, so it was a, a different type of book. I wanted, first of all, to give the freedom of someone to someone not to read the whole book. This is 200 pages, and I wanted everyone to get what I'm trying to say in 20 pages. So there are eight meditations. They are all independent. They are all saying the same thing from different angles. So the first one is about self-inquiry. This, this is at the core of all philosophical traditions, from uh, India to China to Africa to North America to, of course, Greek uh, tradition. The love of wisdom. That's why you do philosophy. That's at the core. They, they became an academic field. But at the core, these people were living together because they wanted to know who they were, not to get a degree. There was no degree involved at the time, uh, in the ancient times. The second one is human decluttering. I personally really love this, uh, this chapter. Maybe you know what I'll do better because I don't want to take too much time on this. Um, let's go to the images. By the way, there are uh, AI generated images uh, to chat uh, GPT. Yeah. So the second one is the human decluttering. And I personally really love this chapter because it's a chapter that usually is not addressed. It's the 99% of our time uh, during the so called Paleolithic times and early Neolithic times. And that area is never studied, or very, very rarely studied, unless you go into paleontology or maybe archaeology. And it is an incredible time uh, that uh, is really, I think, uh, part of who we are. And if we don't understand that, if we erase that from our studies, we will never know who we are. And during this time, humans could not be anthropocentric in the modern sense of the term. Because if you just think of the human, so they said that you are, uh, these gathering, uh, these hunter-gatherers groups were, let's say, probably between 20 and 30 people. I wouldn't say much less than that, because it would be risky to go around for a while the animals to eat you. Everyone would be not too much uh, more than that, because it would be hard to move around. This is nomadic time, not settling yet. Nomadic settlings, but not borders, no agriculture yet. No agriculture yet, it's before the agricultural revolution. And so, if during this time, if you go to an area, so now think of yourself in the tribe, you can think of your friends, maybe family, some group that you actually feel good with, and you're moving around, you're living with these people, and usually there are trajectories, like, you know, like the planets going around the sun. We are nomadic in our cosmic movements, and we go back to the same places. The same at the nomadic, you know, during the nomadic period, people would go to some of the same places. And so if you go to an area, and you kill all the animals, if you go back to the same area, one year later, you're going to be starving. If you go to an area and you get all the mushrooms and you, you, take all, you, know, you cut all the trees down and you go back, you're going to be starving. So at this stage, for instance, we have amazing cave paintings from the Paralympic time. And the knowledge of these people of their surrounding was pristine. Because the human was not considering separation from so-called nature. I think it's an incredible time, very fascinating. There is also a really beautiful section to me about bonobos. Because we usually hear that we share 99% of our DNA with chimps, which is true. We don't hear that we share 99% of our DNA with bonobos. And bonobos are matrifocal, matriarchal, they are not into war, they are very playful, they are very type of pansexuality, they are very different from uh, chimps. I, no, I have nothing against chimps. But if you want to know who we are, you cannot just focus on one of the animals that we share so much DNA with. So I, I love this, uh, this chapter, I highly recommend people to read it because it's a lot of things that you don't usually hear about. So then we go into uh, biology. So all these chapters are saying the same thing from different angles. This is biology, 
here we talk about uh, uh, DNA, we're talking about uh, holobions, we're talking about your DNA, that if it's, it's not just human DNA, but all the bacteria and viruses making you are part of, of your whole genome, and that resides your key to health. In fact, that type of genome can be shifted very quickly. While your human DNA takes generation to, to, to mutate and change, your other, your second, for the second genome, can change in, in a couple of weeks. So there is a lot of studies are right now done on the whole genome, very fascinating, and it is really a posthumanist approach that I have to recommend. There is also more reflection on transhumanism and the dictator's paradox. And this is the, the question. If we are going, for instance, into radical extension, if we are no longer just living eight years, but let's say 10,000 years, of course not everyone is going to agree with this. Some people are going to say, guess what, I'm not going to do it. Other people are going to say, I would love to do it, but I don't have resources to do it. Other people are going to say, I would love to do it, but I live in a country where I don't have access to this kind of biotechnological discoveries. So we're going to have a scenario where we're going to have different people having different rights and different expectations and different resources. Now, someone living 1,000 years, for instance, would have the same rights as someone living eight years. Could they marry? Or someone living 10,000 years, if they marry someone who can only live 80 years, would, would they have some type of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a different type of contract in mind? Would they get the job? Because now I know that someone, I don't have to pay their insurance for 10,000 years. But the other one, after 80 years, I'm sorry about that, but we have some problems here. So what about rights and possibilities? What about jobs opportunities? What about someone like Hitler, I give an example, but any dictator you can think, who wants to be cryonized? So if you do not know what cryonized means, it means in the process of death, you're not going to be uh, buried or, or burned or anything like that, but you're going to place in a facility, you're going to be cryonized with the hope that in the future, the reason why you're dying now is going to be very easy fix. So, you know, maybe 200 years ago, you might die with, a, with a, some, uh, you know, some type of fever. Nowadays, you take an antibiotics and boom, you're fine. So a lot of diseases now, right now that you will die for, uh, maybe 200 years from now, are going to be nothing, maybe. So that's the hope of the people for getting cryonized. And there are, a, there are facilities uh, actually not too far from here, one in the US, and another one is in Russia at the moment. So what about uh, someone like Hitler? If, if a dictator wants to be cryonized, would they have the right to come back to the future? <coughs> and so I had this very interesting conversation with Max Moll, mm -hmm. who is a very famous uh, transhumanist philosopher. And he was saying, well, the right to be cryonized is a human right. And I was saying, well, it is interesting, but someone who obviously infringed a lot of other human rights, do they have that right? As a society, would we give them a priority? Or what about the cryo genic uh, activist scenario. Someone maybe who was a victim of genocide, they survived there. They want to be cryonized because they want to bring their story to the future. They want to be embodied history. They don't want that to happen again. Would they have uh, a priority if we have Hitler and this, for instance, activists? Who are going to choose? <laughs> so I'm not giving answers, but I'm going to pose a lot of questions. Because these are the questions that we need to pose as a species. Because these things are happening. And I always say this is not science fiction. Nothing against science fiction, beautiful, but this is not science fiction. This is happening. So we need to really think about this with, with 